technical issues there. Welcome, everyone. Um, uh, it's great to be able to actually be back in person. Uh, welcome to those who are over the live stream and those in person. It's great to be able to actually see all of your beautiful faces. Well, most of you anyway, without masks, Dad, maybe you put yours back on for a little while. That's probably helpful um, for us. Um, I can just say it's an absolute joy, though, really, to be back in here. I also have to say from the outset, if that I randomly stop in the middle of this sermon and start again or at different points, it's because I've forgotten that you can't do that in real life. You could only do that on Zoom recordings, so, I mean, on video recordings. But, you know, it's been a bit like that, hasn't it, as we've come out of this really strange lockdown period. We've kind of forgotten how to, to do some basic things. I don't know what you've forgotten. Perhaps you've forgotten how to socialise in real life. I know that I've found myself saying some really strange things over the last couple of weeks, and my wife has just looked at me and shook her head. Maybe that joke was one of them at the start. Um, perhaps you've forgotten how to dress in public. Uh, don't look around now, don't make it awkward for everyone, but we've spent so much time in our pyjamas and our trackies that we've forgotten actually how to dress in real life. And maybe for you parents out there, you've forgotten how it actually is to have a conversation with an adult. You've spent 24-7 with your kids. Well, guess what? Holidays are back. <laughs> 2020 has changed a lot and it's made us forget a lot, hasn't it? And I think on a more serious level, I wonder what 2020 has done to our view on God, to our view on Christ. Has it caused us for, to forget or to twist or even to set aside some of who he is? Because it's been a tough year, right, on, on multiple different levels. We've had this worldwide pandemic, not to mention the, the many different opinions on how serious is it, it is. Some say it's really serious, some say it's not serious at all. We've had increasing uh, destabilisation around the world with the 2020 US elections and all that strangeness, not to mention China's less than friendly attitude towards us. We've been locked away from our friends and our family, Not to, and this has often caused many Christians, actually, to kind of have this bunker-down attitude. The end times are here. Get ready to watch the world burn. Not to mention the many personal struggles that I know many of you in this congregation have had. We've all had them, right? Loss of loved ones, suffering, sickness, mental health challenges, a lack of direction. Where is God leading me in this season? All of these things have put pressure on our view of God, on our view of Christ. And 2020, more than any other year, has forced us kind of to consider who Christ is. But there's also been that temptation to forget, to forget who He is, to allow these hardships, these difficulties, to cause us to forget aspects of who He is. Well, today's passage is going to be a great reminder for us of the God that we serve, of the Saviour that we serve, and most importantly, how He deals with us even in the midst of these challenges. So if you have your Bibles there, why don't you open them to Luke chapter 1? That's where we'll be spending our time today. John, how do I put this up? I just, it's a bit low. Does anyone know how to... Thanks, Sheru. I just feel like I'm looking way down. Is that your height? That's the last time I asked that question. Um, well, why don't we pray together as we get started? Uh, Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for this opportunity to be together. We pray that through this passage, you will remind us of who we are celebrating in this season and with every day of our lives. We pray that Christ may be exalted in our hearts 
And because of this, our actions will change. We ask these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. Now, if you've got your Bibles open to Luke chapter 1, you're probably thinking, I really hope we're not going through the entire chapter because it's got 66 verses. Don't worry, we're not going to be. Uh, We're going to be focusing on a particular aspect of this chapter, the Magnificent, or Mary's Song of Praise. So we're going to focus our attention on that those verses. But before we do that, we do need to get the context of what happens, where this praise comes from. And so bear with me as we speed through this story. Follow along in your Bibles with me as we go through the beginning part of this chapter at lightning pace. Now, Luke was written, no surprises, by Luke. And he says in the first couple of verses that he is written to a guy named Theophilus, who was most likely a high, a high up ruling Gentile. And he says that he's written to him to give him certainty about the things of Christ, certainty about the events surrounding Christ. And because of this, Luke goes into a bit more detail than the rest of the gospel writers. Particularly here at the beginning, he goes into a lot of detail about the birth of Christ and also the birth of John the Baptist. And so in verses 5 to 25, we're introduced to a couple of characters. We're introduced to a priest named Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth. And we learn several very flattering things about them. Well, not really. We learn that they were both very old or advanced in years. I don't know what's better, what you'd prefer to be called. We learn that Elizabeth was barren. Now, I don't know what you know about this, but if she was barren and she was old, that automatically gives her a very low standing in society. Someone who couldn't have kids back there was not considered someone who was well off. In fact, barrenness was considered a kind of curse from God. And so old and barren, this is the first kind of couple we're introduced to. But we also learn that Zechariah, the priest, the one who should be um, walking faithfully, actually has some problems with belief in this chapter. The angel appears to him and says, your prayers have been answered finally. You can imagine how much he's been praying for his wife to conceive. And yet when the angel says, Zechariah goes, well, how do I know? And Gabriel's kind of offended by this and strikes him dumb, unable to speak in this moment. And yet the good news is, God graciously still allows Elizabeth to become pregnant despite Zechariah's lack of faith. And so so far we have this far too old barren couple with some belief struggles and yet God still comes through and allows Elizabeth to be pregnant with John the Baptist who later Jesus will say there is no one greater than this man. And then in verses 26 to 38 we're introduced to Mary And we learn very early that Mary is a virgin, and we know from other sources that she was very young, most likely still in her teenage years. Again, someone who, in society's eyes back then, would have been looked down upon quite low. She wasn't married yet, she was a young girl, women often had to be married back then to have worth. She wasn't. Again, another person low in society. And yet, interestingly enough, we see that she is the one who believes, not the priest Zechariah, Mary, the young girl, she believes what the angel says when he tells her that she's going to give birth to Jesus, who will be son of the Most High. And then we get to verses 49 to, 39 to 45, just before the passage we're going to be focused on, and there's this really interesting story. This is one of my favorite passages, just for its simplicity. No other gospel includes it. Just read what happens here when Mary goes to visit Elizabeth for the first time in verse 40. Here's what it says, and she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth, and when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leapt in her womb. So Mary comes in and this baby leaps in her womb. Now I've got to be honest here that this verse has taken on a whole new meaning for me lately. Some of you may know that Signa and I are expecting a baby, and one of the joys for me of that has been seeing that this baby actually responds to my voice, and it moves. It's incredible. But this is even more amazing because the baby leaps not because it hears Mary's voice, but because it knows that the Lord of all things has entered the room. Look at what Elizabeth says in verse 43. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord 
should come to me. For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy, and blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. The baby leaps for joy. The promised Savior has come. I think this is an amazing foreshadowing of John's life, where he'll spend all his life pointing others to Christ. Even in this very early moment, he's rejoicing that the Christ has come. And this section finishes with Elizabeth calling Mary blessed. Blessed because she believed the words of God. And so this is what sets us up for this scene. This praise that Mary's about to sing, it comes out of what has followed, just, we've just read. And so we're going to read through our passage now. I just realised I probably shouldn't have moved this up, hopefully Caleb can see. Um, I'm going to invite Caleb up to read us through the verses for today, looking at verse 46, if you've got your Bibles there. Caleb, why don't you come up and read out this passage for us? And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Saviour. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his offspring forever. Caleb, for that great reading, well done. Um, So we see here this wonderful song of praise that Mary sings in response to what God has done for her. So why don't we look a little bit closely at what goes on here. So she begins in verses 47 to 49, praising God for what he has done personally for her in her life. Her soul magnifies the Lord, her spirit rejoices in God, her saviour. So we see this praise flowing out of Mary's mouth and note here that she knows that God is her saviour. Mary is no more special than anyone else. She's a sinner just like everyone else who needs a saviour just like everyone else. And she speaks about how God has looked upon her humble estate. Now, we spoke about this just before, right? She was in no position of ruling in society. She was looked down upon probably in society for the position she was in. She was humble in her state, and yet God has looked upon her humility and raised her up. And I love this verse, verse 49. She says, He who is mighty has done great things for me. Holy is his name. Really what Mary is displaying in these first few verses is a heart that has been transformed, a heart that knows who her saviour is, who recognises her own insignificance in the world and yet has come to realise God's mightiness in the world and absolute grace at providing salvation for her. And so I guess it's only logical to pause here and to ask, is this your story as well? Can you utter these words with Mary from your heart, that he who is mighty has done great things to you, that that you've realised your own insignificance, your own humility, your own ability to do nothing, and yet notice that there is a mighty God who has graciously done great things for you, specifically in Christ on his cross. Is this your story? Can you utter these words with Mary? I pray that it is your story, but if it isn't your story, I pray that this morning you may come to see who Jesus Christ is and what he has done for you. And so she begins by this personal praise to God for all that he has done, but then in verse 50, the the song changes. She turns, actually, to focus her attention on God. 
and who he is. And no longer is it just personally talking about God, she's actually speaking on behalf of Israel, which is something common that would happen in these kind of songs. And so we're going to see that she points out three points about God, three things about who God is, and that's what we're going to focus on today, three quick points of who God is. So point one happens in verse 50, look at that for me. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. And so the first thing that Mary shows us about God is that he's a merciful God. Praise God for that, right? He's a merciful God. And specifically, his mercy is for those who fear him. So what does that mean? Now, obviously, we know that it doesn't mean those who are afraid or scared of God. A better word to use would be reverence. Those who know that God is God and they are not. Those who are obedient to God and respectful of God. And we see that all throughout the Old Testament, don't we? Those who knew that God's, God's place, who had a reverence for him, God showed them mercy. It didn't mean they were perfect. In fact, it, it meant that they knew they weren't perfect, but God was perfect. And so Mary paints this picture of a God full of mercy for those who fear him, who have reverence for him. You know, I think we do well as Christians to often get ourselves, get before ourselves the greatness of our God. To remind ourselves of our smallness and insignificance compared to a great and mighty God. Because this creates this reverence, this fear in us. And I don't know how you do that. Perhaps you get out in nature and see who God is. Or I would recommend reading Job 38 to 42 where God just answers in a series of questions to Job about how awesome he is. It's a great thing as Christians to remind ourselves of God's bigness. And so that's the first thing he points out here, she points out here. But the second thing is in verse 51 and 52, which really flows on from this point. Mary points out the second thing about God. Look at, look at that with me in verse 51. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in their thought, the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. So the second thing we learn about God, we learn that our God brings down the proud and the mighty on their thrones, but he raises up, he exalts the humble. And I think this is such an amazing truth about our God. I think this is almost my favorite thing about what God does. And I know if you've noticed that, that all throughout the Bible, that God seems to choose the least qualified people for the jobs he has. In fact, the whole nation of Israel, he didn't choose because they were good. He actually said he chose them because they were the most stubborn, stiff-necked people out there, and he could display his glory through them. Time and time again, this is what our God does. He used David, the lowly shepherd, he used Moses, the murderer, Abraham, the liar, from an idol-worshipping family. Countless others that God raises up those who are nothing. It's an incredible thing about our God that he comes alongside those who have nothing going for them and raises them up. He exalts the humble. This is what our God does, and it's opposite to what the world does, right? The world looks for those who are most qualified, those who have everything going for them, and they, that's who they choose, but our God's the opposite. He shows grace to those who have nothing. That's the story of our God right throughout the Bible. This is what our God does. But also, well, actually, let's reflect on that one just for a little bit. I want to read some verses from 1 Corinthians, because again, I think this is a really helpful reminder to our souls of who our God is, and that we're no different to anyone else we read in the Bible. Listen to these verses from 1 Corinthians, in the beginning of 1 Corinthians, that talks to Christians there about where they've come from. Listen to these words and apply it to ourselves. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you are wise, according to worldly standards. Not many of you were powerful. Not many of you were noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. Did you hear what he called those who are his children in those verses? Not powerful, not of noble birth, foolish, weak, 
low, despised, and yet we are the people he chose. As believers, we can have nothing but humility before our God and before others. We were nothing, and yet he called us and he chose us. He didn't call anyone in this room because we had some skill to offer him that would help his kingdom. No, he called us by his grace, his absolute grace. And so, I guess, again, to pause here and ask ourselves the question, have our hearts become proud before God? Have we begun to kind of look down on the sinners out there and shake our heads? Do we need need to be reminded of the fact that God has called us by his absolute grace? That there was nothing in us that deserved that, but it was all him. God exalts the humble. But he also, in this verse, he brings down the proud, and we need to remember this about our God. Perhaps you've become discouraged by the state of the world in this time, and you've forgotten that God does bring down the proud. All the mighty leaders who ultimately trust in themselves over God, God will bring them down. That is true of who he is. Our God exalts the lowly, and he brings down the proud. And we see this all over this first chapter, right? I don't know if you noticed that when we quickly went through Luke. It wasn't Zechariah the priest who you would expect to believe. It was Mary, the lowly, lowly young woman who believes. Luke is trying to show us here that God is exalting those of lowly estate. They were nothing impressive. And so that's point two. God exalts the humble and brings down the proud. And the final thing we see in these verses, in verse 53, read this with me. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. So not only is our God a merciful God who has mercy on those who fear him, not only does he exalt the humble and bring down the proud, but he also fills the hungry with good things, and the rich he sends away empty. Now, I don't think this is only talking about material wealth, although I think that's a big part of it, because in Jesus' day, it was common that the rich would oppress the poor. And so there is an element where it's talking about material wealth, but we also know from other parts of the Bible that it's talking about spiritual hunger. Jesus says that he is the bread of life and the living water for those who thirst and hunger. We know that Jesus talked about those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, Ultimately, what these verses are saying, and again, it's such an amazing truth, if we would just reflect on it a little bit, that God fills the hungry with good things, that ultimately, we have a God who fills up those who look to Him to be filled. Those who know that no riches of this world, nothing in this world can satisfy, but only He can. It's an incredible thing about our God. He fills us with good things. Do you believe that about God? And notice here, again, a reorienting of what Israel had come to believe. Israel thought that the rich and the mighty were blessed by God, and the poor and the lowly were actually cursed by God. Luke 1's trying to remind me, no, no, that's not the way it is. God fills the hungry with good things. Those who have nothing, that's who our God is. And He sends the rich away empty. And maybe today that's a good reminder for you. Maybe today you need to be reminded that our God fills the hungry with good things. And maybe over this coronavirus season, you've come to realise that actually you're hungering and looking for other things. That you've been finding what only God can offer in your money or your job or even one another in this season of separation. Perhaps you've come to realise that you've been getting your hope and satisfaction from one another. The encouragement here is to turn back to the one who graciously fills us. To think about whether we really believe that God fills us with what we need. What an encouraging thing about our God. And so there's our three points from this passage. It's not complicated. His mercy is for those who fear him. He exalts the humble and brings down the proud, and he fills the hungry with good things, but the rich he sends away empty. This is the upside-down kingdom of God. It's not the way that the world would do it. The world would do it the opposite way, but this is the kingdom 
of our God. But here's the interesting thing about this Song of Mary. You see, we see in these last couple of verses, and and really right throughout this song, that Mary has been speaking in the past tense this whole song. He has scattered the thoughts of the proud. He has brought up the, the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things. And she does the same thing in these final verses. Look at these in verse 54 and 55. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. So you see here that even though Jesus is just in the womb, only recently conceived, Mary speaks in a way that he has helped Israel. She speaks in the past tense. In remembrance of his mercy, he has helped Israel. Israel. Mary shows in these final verses that Jesus is the fulfillment of a promise that God made all the way back to Abraham, that through his seed, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And Mary is saying, this is the one in my womb right now. And yet, if you were to ask an Israelite in this moment, how has God helped his people? They wouldn't see it. They'd have no idea what God had done. And yet Mary speaks in the past tense. And so what we can see here is that just like Zechariah's prophecy that will happen in a few verses, that Mary's song is pointing us forward to what Jesus Christ will do and who Jesus Christ is. And so all these wonderful things we've been learning about God and who he is ultimately are pointing us forward to Jesus Christ as the exact image and representation of God as the one who brings in this upside-down kingdom. You see, the only reason God's been able all throughout the Bible to take sinners who deserve nothing but but punishment and raise them up and be gracious to them is all because of what Jesus has done, all because of what this baby Jesus will do and grow up to do, to die on a cross, to take our sins, to pay the price for them and then rise again and show that they've been dealt with, that they're finished that we can come stand before a holy God. And so Mary's song is actually pointing us forward. While it's praising God for who he is, ultimately it's pointing forward to Jesus and his life, death and resurrection, which makes these things possible. And so it would actually be incorrect of us, I think, from this passage, for the application for us to be, are we being humble? Are we being reverent? Are we being hungry for God? When this verses are really pointing forward to Christ who is perfectly these things because we couldn't be. You see, he is the one who walks in humility. He was the one who came not to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. You see, he is the one who showed perfect reverence for his father who said that he could do nothing without the father. You know, he is the one who hungered and thirsted for God perfectly who went to the desert for 40 days without food, without water, to learn that he lived by God's word alone. This is Jesus Christ. And so to finish with, I want us to actually focus on a passage that highlights this so well, all these aspects about who God is revealed in Christ. Look at Matthew 11, turn there with me, Matthew 11, 28 to 30. It's a passage I've been really challenged by lately, by a guy named Dane Ortland in a book called Gentle and Lowly. Matthew 11, 28. And look for the different things that Mary has been talking about. Matthew 11, 28 says this. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is is light. Can you see the wonderful truth that Mary has been speaking about perfectly displayed in Christ? Jesus opens his arms and says, come to me all who are heavy laden. He specifically calls out those who know that they've got heavy burdens, those who know that they're nothing, those who, who feel and know that they're sinful. He calls them out and tells them to come to him, that he may satisfy their hunger and their thirst. But also Jesus here, he proclaims himself to be lowly, to be humble. How amazing is that, that Jesus shows himself to be accessible to all. That doesn't matter how messy and broken and sinful your life is, you can come to him. He wasn't a king that could not be approached, he was a king that could be approached, despite the messiness of our lives. He is not too high for them. 
He is the true humble one. You see here in these verses that Jesus is the exact representation of what Mary has been talking about. He is the reverent one. He is the humble one. He is the one who perfectly hungers for God, who graciously offers himself for our lack of hunger, for our lack of reverence, for our pride. This is an amazing truth about Christ. And now for those of us who have placed our faith in Jesus, who have come to him, we look to him, do we not? In this season, in every season, we look to this great and amazing Saviour. We look to the one who died for us and rose again so that actually the God of all things and Jesus Christ has a gentle disposition towards us. Do you believe that? He's gentle towards you? That he has unending mercy towards you? That he fills you with good things and he's not going to stop filling you with good things? It's an incredible truth because of what he's done for, on our behalf. This is our God and this is our Saviour. And so I wanted to finish today just by asking one question. Is this the Saviour that we're celebrating this year? Or has 2020 warped our view? Has 2020 changed the way that we see Jesus Christ? Have we forgotten that he is merciful, humble, who fills the hungry with good things, who brings in this upside-down kingdom where the nothing are brought to be sons and daughters of the king? Is this the saviour you're celebrating? And in what ways might you have forgotten that? Perhaps your Christ has become harsh. He looks down upon you, shakes his head most of the time. Occasionally he looks upon you with approval when you do something really, really good for the kingdom. Has he become harsh rather than gentle? Is he the one who fills you with good things? Is that how you think about God? Does he fill you with good things? Or perhaps you feel like he's holding out from you. Like he's not going to really give you what you need. He's holding back. Has he become unmerciful to the very worst? In all the debate that we've been having and all the opinions out there, have you forgotten that Jesus shows mercy to the very worst in our society? Is that the way that you're living? Have you forgotten that that's the way Christ operates? He doesn't shake his head. Have you become proud? Have you forgotten that Jesus humbled himself for you, that the God of all things humbled himself for you? Or perhaps this morning you've forgotten that Christ has the same authority displayed in these verses, that he really can bring down the proud, even the mightiest on their thrones. It feels like the world is out of control, does it not? But nothing has changed. The authority of Christ has not changed. It all sits under his authority and he will bring to account everyone who raises their fist against him. That's who he is. He can blow the nations away and a virus like dust on scales. It's that easy. It's under his authority. Or perhaps there's something else. Perhaps there's something else you need to be reminded of about Christ in this season. We need to remember that this is our Saviour, the promised one. 2020 hasn't changed that. Look to him and see his mercy, his humility, his graciousness towards you. Because that is the only hope that we actually have of being like him to this lost and broken world. It's not going to be by us trying harder. It's going to be us seeing Christ more beautifully, more humble. And if you don't know him, if you've never realised your need of forgiveness, if you've never realised that you need to turn, repent from things that can never give you life and turn towards the only one who can, then I encourage you and invite you to do that today. He does not shake his head at you. He actually says, come. I can handle anything that's happening in your life. I paid for it all on the cross. Turn away from those sins. Turn away from things that can never satisfy to him. Is this the Christ you're celebrating this year? I pray that you will reflect on that. Pray that this passage helps us to realign our vision, not to bunker down for 2021 and expect the worst, but to look to our humble, merciful, good saviour and get on with the work that we've been called to do.
of proclaiming him to a lost, broken and sinful world. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for uh, this chapter in Luke chapter 1. We're thankful for the way it displays to us the kind of God you are, that you raise up people who do not deserve it. Elizabeth, who was barren, who had no hope there, Lord, you, you showed that all things are possible with you. Mary, a young girl who, in such a humble position, you raised her up. These passages display to us the God that you are, but ultimately, Lord, we know that this is only the case because of what Jesus Christ has done. This is only the case because Jesus Christ humbled himself and lived a perfect life, who died on a cross for our sins, who rose from the dead, showing that the payment was acceptable, that all who put their faith in him might come to be righteous and holy before a God, to, to be your children, Lord. Help us to remember that you have gentleness towards us, that you have unending mercy towards us, that you fill us with good things. Lord, I pray that you help us to turn from our idols, many of which have been revealed in this coronavirus season, that we're looking to other things often rather than the one who fills us. Lord, help us to recognize those things and to turn to you. Lord, ultimately I pray that in this season we won't get distracted by all the busyness and all the craziness that goes on, but we'll be in awe of who you are, Lord Jesus, and that'll be the thing that transforms our hearts, that helps us to be good representatives of you to a lost and broken world. Lord, we need you. We can't do this without you. And strengthen us by your spirit within us. We pray these things now in Jesus' name. Amen.